Can we get some quiet in the chamber, please? Thank you. Mr. Blake, for the purposes of an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, colleagues, and, and all those that are uh, assembled on today for a very special and uh, incredibly humbling in introduction. I, I stand here with an, an incredible sense of, of pride and honor and gratitude because we have individuals who not just served our, our country, served our nation, but have continued to serve even after all that has happened in their lives. In 1939, the NAACP took aim at the military's segregationist policies, seeking to create a more inclusive and just military. The Pittsburgh Courier and Yancey Williams of Howard University built upon that work that the NAAC spoke of, continuing to fight for equality in the military. Yancey Williams sued the government to have the opportunity to join the Air Corps, and at the time, there had been no non-white military pilots in the United States of America. This work culminated on July 19, 1941, what was known as the Tuskegee Experiment, when the 99th Pursuit Squadron was activated. Known as the Red-Tailed Angels, the Tuskegee Airmen were the most effective fighter escort squadron in American history. They flew more than 200 combat missions, escorting bombers, never losing a single bomber to enemy aircraft. This record was not matched over the course of the entire war or any that came thereafter. Their military success was not just limited to just bomber escorts. The Tuskegee Airmen were also credited with more than 15,500 sortie, sorties targeting German ground and transport units throughout warfare. By the end of the war, the Tuskegee Airmen had been awarded three distinguished unit citations, including one for their combat mission against German ME-263 fighter jets, the most advanced combat aircraft of its time. Today, colleagues, we are honored and blessed that several of the surviving distinguished original Tuskegee Airmen have joined us for our last day of session. They are here from the Claude B. Govan chapter of New York, celebrating the 75th anniversary of their service to this country. First, William Johnson, who has been incredible in his service. Mr. Johnson was born in 1925 in Glen Cove, New York, always wanting to be a pilot, watched planes fly in and out of Mitchell Airfield in Long Island until 1944, when he turned 18 and joined the U.S. Air Corps. His class was the second to last class to graduate from Tuskegee in the class designation 45I. Mr. Johnson then retired from the Air Corps in 1946, but continued his trailblazing path as the Vice President of Glen Cove NAACP and a member of the Nassau Health and Welfare Council. Mr. Audley Colehurst was born in 1925 in New York City. He was raised in Harlem and joined the Air Corps in 1942, was a radio operator and a gunner for B-35 Mitchell Medium Bombers and received a sharp shooter designation for his work a good conduct medal, a crew member wings as well. As part of the 477th, he was packed and ready to deploy into combat in the Pacific Theater when the atomic bomb was dropped in Japan, ending the war. He continued to serve until 1949 and continued to break down barriers, becoming one of the first black CPAs in the United States of America. We're also joined by Wilford DeFore, born in the Panama Canal Zone in 1918, Mr. DeFore was brought to Harlem at an early age and inducted into the Military Air Corps in 1942. After completing basic training at Tuskegee, he continued to do more work locally in the airfield. Mr. DeFore was assigned to the engineering office, the 366th Air Force and Air Service Squadron as the engineering office, administrative NCO, and technical sergeant as well. Went on to serve overseas in Italy, where he serviced combat aircraft before and after missions eventually returning to the United States after the war had been completed. Also, when we're acknowledging Mr. DeFore, he's joined by his daughter, Darlene. We're also here joined by Mr. Robert Thorpe, who has also served this country remarkably and incredibly well. 
and giving back as the other airmen have as well. They are joined also, Mr. Speaker, and our colleagues by Judge Mark Winton, Michael Joseph, Denise Pease, who are all members of the Claude B. Govan chapter as well. Being in the presence of these men is an incredible honor and their families. And we thought it was an appropriate way to conclude session this year, Mr. Speaker and colleagues, with this being the 70th, 75th anniversary of their service, to give them their, their recognition on today. There's a personal note of, uh, note of preference as well. As the only African-American male in the Veterans Affairs Committee, and as the youngest brother of someone who has served this country for 29 years as a Sergeant First Class in the U.S. Army, it is with great pride that we can be here on today with the first African-American speaker, Carl Heasty, but an African-American speaker pro tem, Jeff Aubrey, and all those that have come thereafter and all those that will continue thereafter in that service. We are grateful for your service. We are here because of you, and we can never, ever repay what you have done for this country. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, I thank you for the opportunity to introduce our Tuskegee Airmen. Mr. Mosley on the same subject. Sub subject. Heroes, heroes in time and space, these men who served our country and continue to serve their, our country through their examples of how they lived their lives as soldiers and now as retirees and men who have, are living out the last portions of their lives and, and, and last chapters of their lives. But more importantly, these are men to me who are not merely just figures in history, but during a time in which tyranny and fascism was rampant throughout Europe, uh, these men s stood up for this country, even when this country in and of itself was not standing up for them, understanding that there was a, fought, a war to be fought overseas, but when they came home, had to fight another war. I want to commend my colleague for bringing these heroes, these American heroes, these African-American heroes, to our chamber to understand that Warfare is not guaranteed who is the ultimate victor and who is the one who is to be defeated. But these men who sacrificed so much, and many of their friends who made the ultimate sacrifice, I want to thank them from the depths of my heart for all that you've given to this nation and the example by which you set for us and for me and for many generations to come. There are roughly 900 men who came through the Tuskegee program, and now there are only 90 left nationwide. And we will always remember you, because although you may be diminishing in numbers, your presence illuminates endlessly. So again, I want to thank my colleague, Mr. Blake, for bringing these men and their handlers in the, in, 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 uh, up to Albany to understand that we will never forget what you've given to us as a country and what you've given to us as a free world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Dendecker on the same subject. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I cannot tell you what an honor it is to be able to speak here today. Just to give uh, an idea of some of the accomplishments of this unit, it's 1,578 combat missions in total, including, as uh, my colleague Mr. Blake was mentioning, the bomber escort missions. 112 enemy aircraft destroyed in the air, another 150 on the ground, and 148 damaged. 950 rail cars, trucks, or other motor vehicles destroyed. 40 boats and barges destroyed. As a unit, three designated unit citations one silver star, 96 flying crosses, 14 bronze stars, 744 air medals, and eight purple hearts. One of the most decorated units ever to serve in our country. We are in awe, we are in honor, we owe you the greatest debt of, of our, our existence to your efforts during World War II, and we honor you here today. We're honored by your presence here today. And I uh, would just ask that we please uh, uh, not only uh, give them all the cordialities of the House and the floor, but all of our respect and honor that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Thank you, Mr. Dundecker. Mr. Rivera on the same subject. I uh, also want to join in thanking uh, our uh, brother Blake for bringing these outstanding uh, members of our country to this body. I know one of them. He's not here today, but I know Dr. Roscoe Brown. He was born in uh, March of uh, 1922. The youngest of uh, two children, his father working as a public health specialist and his mother as a teacher. After graduating, he could have gone on to a good job, but he chose to join the Air Force. I know Dr. Ro Roscoe Brown because in 1984, I was already a member of this body. And in those days, we were rebuilding the Bronx. But the borough of the Bronx is known, as we have noticed or said quite often, as the, the borough that has the New York Yankees. But it's also the borough of universities. It's got Austin's Community College. It's got Mer uh, Mercy College. It's got Lehman College. It's got Boricua College, but it was Dr. Roscoe Brown who became president of Bronx Community College. And he turned that institution around. Today, if you visit with the help of this body, we were able, and with the leadership of Dr. Roscoe Brown, we were able to restore the Hall of Fame to its natural beauty. This body did that. This body has contributed to making that college the one of the finest and best looking educational institution that we have in this entire state, I dare say in the nation. You should all visit that campus. It looks better than Fordham University. And it's beginning to look like that. Dr. Roscoe Brown, in 1984, my brother Barry, especially 88, we brought Jesse Jackson to the Bronx to start his campaign for president of the United States. You're not gonna, you probably look in the internet, you're not gonna find this. But if you call my, if you call me to the, the question, I'll show you the video. Not on the internet, but you see Jesse Jackson begin his campaign for president, and then he move on to Brooklyn. How do you think you got a town selected? Because people strategize. My brother, and he began in a beautiful borough of the Bronx. Many people don't know that. It's just Dr. Roscoe Brown, a myself best kept secret as to how people should come together and unite in the strategy to empower to others. It's a lot of history. So I stand here today welcoming this group of servicemen who serve at a time when night, neither they or I or people that look like me or sound like me with my fluent broken English go and, and, and eat it in any restaurant in this country. They are really to be admired, because they paved the way. They pay a way, and they serve this country very loyally. Anybody else like today would drop bombs in, a, in our own neighborhood. No, they were loyal. They were not tempted. They were not distracted. They knew they were part of building a great nation. And we are better today in spite of the idiots who are going across this country committing crime and committing, killing innocent people. But they, and in spite of those idiots, at the end of the day, we might do the thinking and the struggle. We can say they made a tremendous contribution to making this country a much better country than it is, but we still have a lot of work today. Thank you, my brother Blake, 
for bringing all these outstanding group of servicemen who are still active. Dr. Brown is still active for 30 years with the Girl Scouts. I can go on and I go on. So I just thought I'd share my experience with one airman by the name of Roscoe Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Mr. Levine on the same subject. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Speaker. Um, and thank you, Michael Blake, for organizing this. Um, for us, what a unique experience to be able to share, share the, this room with these transformational uh, American heroes. Um, they are giants and every American stands on their shoulders. For me, it's a very special, uh, uh, personally, it's a very special moment because Bill, William Johnson is my uh, friend and neighbor and uh, I've, been, uh, I've been privileged to honor his contribution to our community and our state and our nation and even our little hometown of the city of Glen Cove many times before. Good to see you, Bill. Welcome, gentlemen, and please provide them with the warmest, warmest of welcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Mr. Katz, on the same subject. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as a student of history, I'm uh, in awe to be in the presence of some of the greatest of the greatest generation. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely speechless. I know of your exploits and the incredible actions that you took for the United States of America at a time when you yourselves were not free from segregation and your fight for equality. And you fought for our country to save another land, to save another continent, and only came back to have to fight once again for your freedom. And did so throughout your lives with the greatest dignity, with the greatest accolades from the rest of a grateful nation. I, for one, from a Jewish persuasion, can do nothing but thank you for the efforts on behalf of our country and on behalf of America that you helped to make a great nation and to take away the, the barriers that so afflicted the people of your race during our history. I can only thank you for your service and thank God that you are still here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Ms. Bishot on the same subject. subject. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it is with great honor and privilege to be in the same room with the Tuskegee Airmen, distinguished African Americans who fought in the war, fought for our country. I consider them truly my heroes. I certainly want to thank Assemblymember Blake for organizing and allowing this chamber, the People's House, to have this special moment with the Tuskegee Airmen. These are men who sacrificed their lives when many parts of the world didn't even care about African Americans. They shed their blood to help this country, this nation. My brother was a veteran and these men paved the way for people in my family to serve this country. So I just want to say thank you so much. All the members of the Tuskegee Airmen who are here, who are just being here, having your presence here. It's with joy, it's with honor and, and humility to be in this room with them. Thank you so much. I, I ask you that you extend the, the warmest cordiality to these distinguished African-American historic heroes here today in the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bashat. Ms. Robinson on the same subject. Thank you very much. Um, I stand with my colleague, Mr. Blake, and acknowledging these distingu distinguished and outstanding persons that have come to join us in this chamber today. I want to say, first of all, thank you for your service. 
I also want to remind you that we had a Tuskegee Airman that served in this chamber by the name of Percy Sutton. Percy Sutton was one of those who distinguished himself in so many ways after his service by being a promoter and owner of the Apollo Theater in Harlem, also being the owner operator of a radio station, and also so many other enterprises that he was involved in for the benefit of our communities. Percy Sutton left us a few years ago, and we as, uh, he as a founder of the caucus, the Black Puerto Rican Hispanic Caucus, Percy Sutton was one of those founders over 50 years ago, over 50 years ago. And so we stand proud as members of that caucus and also in the spirit of Percy Sutton, who served us so well. So, Mr. Speaker, would you please provide these distinguished individuals with the cordialities of this House? With pleasure, Ms. Robinson. On behalf of Mr. Blake, Mr. Mosley, Mr. Dendecker, Mr. Rivera, Mr. Levine, Ms. Bichat, Ms. Robinson, Mr. Cat, Mr. Katz, myself, the speaker, and all the members. Gentlemen, it is quite an honor to have you and grace us with your presence here. I can tell you for a fact that a lot of us sitting in this chamber would not be able to take our seats and representing our constituents and our communities throughout the work and the toil and the sacrifices that you made serving this country. So I want to be the first and most certainly not the last to thank you for your service. And gentlemen, it is an honor to have you here. We hope to, we will extend the privileges of the floor, but remember gentlemen, every time you're here, the, the cordialities are always extended to you. And again, gentlemen, thank you so much for your sacrifice, your service to this country, and allowing us to serve our constituents. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, sir. Um, we'll certainly uh, try to accommodate folks who want to take their photographs, understandably. Um, in the interim, if we could uh, begin on consent uh, on page uh, 18, and we'll just give it just a moment or two, maybe, Mr. Speaker, but when we do, if we could begin consent with rules report 397 on page 18 of the main calendar.
Oui. Give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can do it, but people have to do it quietly. Yeah, we can, we've done this before. Yeah. Clerk will read. Assembly 9110A, Rules Report 397, Mr. Morelli, an act to amend the labor law and the workers' compensation law. On a motion by Mr. Morelli, the Senate bill is before the House. The Senate bill is advanced. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. Clerk will record the vote. Mr. Morelli. Well, Ms. Speaker, this is what I hope will be our last first vote of the session. So I would encourage people to embrace, embrace that, um, cast their votes quickly so we can uh, move along. And uh, as I said, as we get through our work quickly here, um, we will be done quicker. So uh, please ask members to cast their first vote of the day. The motto of the day, the faster, the better. If you are... In your seats, please vote. If you are out of the chamber, come in and vote. Please raise your hands, those in the back. Thank you very much. Let us begin. Somebody's been trying to steal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Escaping from you at every turn. Yeah, and this is not the pen I want to leave. I didn't have it in the pen. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Eyes 91, noes 14. The bill is passed. Assembly 9161, rules report 398, Mr. Cusick, an act to amend the general city law. On a motion by Mr. Kuzik, the Senate bill is before the House. The Senate bill is advanced. Read the last section. Home rule message is at the desk. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. Clerk will record the vote. 